I want to talk about something that's a little bit unique. Um, when we start thinking about the role of the coach, the importance of the coach, and, and essentially kind of how everything is going to, eh, you know, work together, and especially with regards to understanding what is right and wrong. And <coughs> excuse me, when you when you deal with there, there's two major paradigms when dealing with the concept of right and wrong. You have ethics and kind of that whole understanding of morality. Where you have this much more um, kind of less philosophical and a little bit more commonsensical understanding of deviance. Now, deviance is oftentimes associated with crime. Now, the problem with that is, and it's not necessarily a problem as much as one of the unique attributes then becomes the fact that um, deviant behavior and crime or any type of criminality are not the same. Okay? And, and there are the basic definitions right there. To be involved with cr uh, committing a crime, you have to violate a law or, or, or some sort of statute and you're going to receive some sort of sanction and it's going to be imposed upon you, the individual, by some sort of political entity. The police, the courts, whatever. Now, keep in mind that when we talk about the NCAA and a coach violating the rules of the NCAA, most of the time the coach is not breaking a law. It's breaking a bylaw. Okay? Um, the NCAA is not an organization that can create law. It has rules and protocols and policies and, and things like that. Okay. Um, now, when you look at the definition of deviance and you talk about ideas or things that we do that are beyond the scope of toleration, um, from who? Well, basically society. And the idea is that what constitutes deviant behavior is constantly changing. That's what we mean by it's a social construction. It's the fact that what is right and wrong now is because we define it right now in this place, in this space, during this time period as wrong. It's not, it's not to say that tomorrow might change. If you look at outside the realm of sports, one day drinking in the United States at the age of 18 was, it was okay. All right? The very next day, that law changed and became 21. All right, that's an example of more of a, a, a law and things like that. But if you think about early on in the history of the NFL, there was a guy named Nitrain Lane for the uh, uh, Detroit Lions in the 1950s. And he had a very, very specific philosophy. He said, if you can't breathe, you probably aren't going to run anymore. So he would clothesline people when he tackled them. Because he's like, well, if they get hit in the neck, then they won't run anymore. And you know what? It's genius. Because, you know what, if I can't breathe, I'm probably not going to run, right? Well, there were no rules. There was no, that was seen as okay. Nowadays, compare that to the NFL, and, you know, with hits of the head, a defenseless receiver, and things like that, things have changed. Okay, and that's all we're trying to talk about here. And the coach, you know, one of the things when you look at understanding deviant behavior um, with Joe Paterno and Penn State, now, obviously what we know is that... Um, former coach Sandusky and all the different um, counts of sexual molestation, rape, and sexual assault against all those young boys. That was abhorrent. It was horrific. It was disgusting. It was terrible. We know he was in the wrong. <clears throat> the question became, what about Joe Paterno? Protecting. Now, he didn't see as him himself as doing anything wrong. He's like, well, I went and reported it to the people above me. And what a lot of people outside of Penn State Athletics was saying is, yeah, that's fine, except I think you're supposed to call the cops as well. All right? So there's not necessarily always going to be 100% agreement on what constitutes deviant behavior. Okay? A coach, um, some coaches in football teach their players how to hold, like linemen, how to hold their opponent and not get caught. Now, Look at the definition of deviant behavior. Actions, ideas that are beyond the toleration limits. It seems wrong to teach someone how to break a rule in sport, but we know that there are a huge number of coaches that do that. Is it deviant if many people are doing it? That always becomes the question. Okay, and that's sort of setting the tone for this discussion of deviant behavior because in the end, it, it really is, it's up to who decides what is right and wrong, usually it's society or culture and things like that. Um, the fact that 
as we've spoken about before, a coach, <clears throat> excuse me, a coach can go up, a football coach, let's say, can go. I'm kind of on a football kick here, apparently. Uh, a football coach can go up, and many times I've seen this with my own eyes. Uh, never happened to me because I didn't play enough, so I don't, I didn't have to worry about that. But, and I've seen it even now, uh, in person on sidelines and also on TV. A coach will grab a player by the kind of the inside of the shoulder pads, or um, kind of by the the helmet. Uh, it's, it's it's really frowned upon to grab them by the face mask because that's very very noticeable. But oftentimes they'll grab their player and just lay into them, yelling, screaming. Okay, is that deviant? Treating an employee like that, that's a no-go. You can't do that. That's deviant. However, a different time, a different space, a different place, and maybe not so much time, but a different arena, if we're talking about sport, lots of times people give coaches leeway with regard to how they treat players, and they don't hold them to the same standard as a manager and an employee. Okay, and so the whole social constructionist nature of deviance, that's what we really want to talk about and jump into this stuff. So the question becomes, man, if there's so much, you know, there's not a consensus on deviant behavior, then how do we understand it? Well, and you know, again, this is my, this is my stuff, this is my wheelhouse, I dig this stuff because it's all about criminology and sport and coaching and, and bringing all these very, very disjointed ideas from all these different areas and combining them together. And what these these theories do, these criminological or these sociology of deviance theories, is that they were developed for practitioners, uh, probation officers, uh, people who worked in the penal system, something like that. Okay, they were they were developed for um, juvenile, um, like the administrators and ju for juvenile offenders and things like that. And so these theories are a little bit, you know, we talked about macro theories and we talked about micro theories. These are kind of like those cultural theories and that they're, they're meso level, which means directly in the middle. Okay, and they help to explain or understand this whole notion of deviant behavior. And social bond, the very first one talks about why, you know, and it's funny, I put it first, but I usually, you know, like, I like to talk about it last because oftentimes a lot of these different theories talk about, you know, how and why someone is defined as deviant or a coach is seen as deviant or, or something. Well, social bond actually goes the other way, and it talks about why do we not deviate, why do we conform? And there's all these there's, there's four major aspects to developing a social bond, commitment, and and all that kind of stuff, participation. Um, and this whole notion of participation is is in reference to conventional activities. And okay, the stronger of a quote unquote social bond that you develop with society, which is usually in reference to authority figures, the more likely the, and it's talking about juveniles, the more likely the juvenile is going to participate in conventional activities, sports, student council, uh, different types of after school programs, whatever. And as a result, um, they're going to increase that interaction with authority figures. And as a result, they tend to be closer to authority figures, so they tend to be more insulated. They don't, they don't get in trouble as much. That insulation from right and wrong. They understand it better. And, and they have this, this concept of authority and expectation. Coaches, uh, you know, if we're talking about participation in conventional activities, sport being one of those, coaches being those authority figures that are crucial for developing that social bond that's going to take that, that youngster and help to develop them as they grow up in society. <clears throat> Differential association is, it, it starts with the basic premise that we as humans learn all behaviors. Well, this, this includes wrong behavior, deviant behavior. And differential association is talking about we tend to learn best from people that are close to us, our family, these intimate peer-oriented groups. Okay, so um, if we tend to learn deviant behavior from those around us, then again, the authority figure within the, the culture or the environment, the atmosphere of sport, the coach is someone who can attempt to redefine or reassess that culture so that deviant behavior is not promoted. Whoa, what are we talking about here, Mark? How about hazing? Okay? We talk about hazing, and when you hear about some of the horrific acts, oftentimes the people involved in hazing don't see that they did anything wrong. And the victims of hazing, 
you, you know, there's no consensus that it's wrong. Many times what constitutes hazing, these are willful participants. Well then who should then say that you're not supposed to be engaging in this type of behavior? Oftentimes in the realm of sport, the coach or the coaching staff needs to develop an atmosphere. It's called a, a kind of an autonomous self-determined climate. Okay, And you need to develop a climate in which these types of processes do not take place. Labeling is, is a lot what it sounds like. If you label something, you put a tag or or you call it something, right? And that label tends to stick with people. And when you think about culture, coaches, what coaches tend to do is they are going, they, they tend to enable this type of labeling. If someone's labeled as a bad teammate, um, coaches, it's a very, very distinct and close-knit group. This, it's almost cliquish, if you will. Now, there, there can be some factions in this clique, but um, and, and what you get is a lot of the perpetuation. If someone is, is said to be uh, whatever, someone who crumbles under pressure, other coaches tend to see that and believe that. And I, I like to use the, the example here of baseball, because baseball is one of those things that it grew up here in, in the United States um, during a time without TV. It was sort of born in person, the newspapers, and then radio as well. And so it's a game that's not necessarily developed for TV, and it's very unique. It doesn't have a play clock or anything like that, and it's very um, deliberate. Right? You don't have 25 seconds to throw a pitch or anything like that. There, there's not necessarily, it's, you know, you, you, you do your nine innings and, or if you need more and that kind of thing. Well, one of the things that baseball struggled with, and it even struggles today, is with this conventional wisdom, the old adages. And baseball is one of those things that didn't embrace the newer technology, newer exercise science, or sports science as readily as some of the other major professional sports here in the United States. For example, for a long time, up until about the 1990s, early 2000s, working out, developing muscle, according to the old adage in baseball, was bad. Because if you had too much mu muscle, you weren't lithe. And what lithe means is kind of fluid in your motions. You were too bulked up, you know? And, and you weren't able to throw a ball. Um, the idea now is sports science. Uh, I was actually reading an article recently in, uh, well, gosh, what was it? Men's Health Journal? Something like that? Anyway, it, it was profiling this uh, coach down in Texas. And he's a pitching pitching coach. And what he did was, and he was, a, he was a softball coach for a while, and he really wanted to get into baseball and talk, work with pitchers and stuff. And he spent almost a decade researching injuries and, and, and all this type of stuff. And he went to doctors, and he went to physiologists, and, and he went to all these different um, idea sets or reservoirs, things, places, and people that are outside the game of baseball. And what he found was... When, when you're trying to teach a, a pitcher how to pitch, they always talk about open up your hips, rotate your hips, use, use the power of your legs. But they weren't telling people how to do that. And those cliches stuck around and, and coach generation after generation was telling people how to throw this way because that's what they did in the past. And what this guy found out was that what they were teaching was actually hard on the hips, it was hard on the knees, it was hard on the shoulder, and it actually decreased the velocity over time of a pitcher because it, it was just hard on the body and so he's taken this new science and he's tried to um, you know kind of change conventional conventional wisdom well early on he was labeled by baseball insiders as kind of a kook this, this quack this this guy who doesn't really know what he's doing and he's just this guy who's trying to come in and change things. Well, that label cost him jobs, cost him um, clients. And he says even now, he's got some Major League Baseball pitchers that are clients. And they kind of sneak around and they don't tell their organization that they're working with him because the label of him and this new science and what they do is so constraining that they, the pitcher, are afraid that they would get in trouble. That's labeling. Okay, and so you know, as a coach, you can label someone as a great player, or you can label them as a bad kid, a bad seed. 
And oftentimes if a coach labels them as that, oh, he's a good kid. You know, she's a hard worker, that kind of thing. Then people tend to believe in the legitimacy of the coach and therefore they believe in the legitimacy of the label, whether it's correct or not. Other things that influence deviant behavior are power. Because power is something that's a byproduct of a, a situation, all right? And um, what I like to talk about here is that power, it's not finite, it changes all the time. And so let's say you have a, um, you know, a volleyball graduate assistant, and this person is an assistant coach. Now they're just one or two years removed from being a collegiate volleyball player, let's say. All right, so they're part coach and they're part student. Well, how much power do they have? You know, in one situation, they have power over those student athletes as a coach. But in another situation, they are subject to power because they are a student. Therefore, they have to do whatever the teacher says. Okay, and it's very, very, I know, almost basic. And I'm not trying to insult your intelligence here or anything. Just, just it's that a coach has power, but what constitutes that power and how much? you know, power they have is going to vary based upon where they are and what they're doing. Authority is a little bit different than power. Authority is what we call a structural arrangement, which means it's the, um, it's the embodiment of, of power. And so when you start thinking about the authority to do something, all right, power is the actual, um, this is sort of a very negative sounding definition, but the ability to force someone to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do, okay? And it's not nearly as nefarious as that sounds, but uh, an authority is much more of where you are in society, and that equates to how much power you have, okay? And so the coach is obviously near the top of a team or an organization, so they have a decent amount of authority. But here, here, here's kind of a nice little example. The um, a few years ago, um, the NFL, there was a lockout. Now, the NBA had one as well and uh, a few years ago, but you had the lockout where the players said, no, we're not going to play under this current collective bargaining agreement. And so they, the players started to decertify the union, and so there just there weren't any players. They weren't going to play. And so you have this, this argument between management and labor. Okay, Well, management were the team owners that run the NFL. And then you had the um, players who were, you know, the labor. Well, where were the coaches? They were nowhere to be seen. Why? They have no they have no union. They have a little bit of power, ability to say what should be done with regards to football matter, but when it comes to authority, in that situation, they had little to none. Okay, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to talk about is that these things change based upon where you are, what type of sport, etc. Um, coaches are not the only authority figures, um, they're not the only leaders, but they are recognizable. And as a result, they're high profile. And as a result of being high profile, they're extremely influential. And the Jefferson Institute for Ethics, um, here's a report, and this is just a quote from it. The good news is, the majority of high school athletes trust and admire their coaches and are learning positive life skills and good values from them. All right, I dig it, I like it. Uh-oh, but I feel like a, a slide change coming on here, and, and when that happens, you have bad news. The bad news is, many coaches, particularly in the high-profile sports of boys basketball, baseball, and football, are teaching kids how to cheat and cut corners without regard for the rules for the rules or traditional notions of fair play and sportsmanship. And this is after doing um, thousands of surveys and, and things like that. So what does this tell us? Coaches are influential and that's because of the role, right? And we keep we talk about this micro macro orientation. So the role of being a coach is influential. The decision of what to influence that student athlete with, you know, in terms of positive values and behaviors, negative values and behavior, that's going to be up to the individual, all right? And that's why talking about where these coaches 
learn these ideas, how they translate these ideas to their players, and how this the whole sort of fraternity of coaching men and women. Their new idea, it takes a while for new ideas to penetrate that very, very closed network. And what we see is that we know that coaches in, in sport as a result can be positive. You know, develops teamwork and all those different things. It can be negative, overshadows competitiveness as well. Now, what becomes problematic is that oftentimes the coaches are going to be the prime sources of discipline. But if they don't discipline players, then it's going to send a quote-unquote mixed message to the rest of the team. Now, Coach um, Jimmy Johnson for the Dallas Cowboys in the early 90s when they won some Super Bowls and stuff, he, he, was, he was very open about this. He said, I have a set of rules for my players, and then I have a set of other rules for my star players. That's not exactly what we're looking for here. Okay? And he's like, well, because they're stars and they're more important, they can get away with more. If you barely made the team, then you have a different set of rules and um, values and sanctions that you have to abide by. All right, that Sending that mixed message, what it does as an authority figure is it decreases the legitimacy of that person in terms of positive social development. Now, that was a professional sport coach. What about if we talk about at the, at the youth level? Right? Uh, I read an article recently dealing with elite um, youth sport coaches in England and, and the amount of emotional cruelty and abuse, especially emotional abuse, that these coaches doled out to these young elite athletes. And one of the things that they noticed is that, and, and a lot of coaches were very, very kind of open about this, is that they, they didn't use the word pick on specific players, but they would discipline one player differently than another player even if they committed the same transgression okay and what it found was that those students that were those uh, athletes those youth 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 athletes if I can spit it out that received that differential punishment those that didn't get punished started to get you know an inflated sense of self in, in the personality they felt like they were kind of the, um, you know nothing could touch them they were the bee's knees so to speak all right, those that always had the punishment, those are the kids that had depression. Those are the kids that had different types of social anxiety disorders. And it manifested itself very quickly, very rapidly, and tended to stick with them all throughout adolescence and into early and middle adulthood. Also, the thing with discipline is, and it kind of goes back to, you know, how you learn to be a coach is that it's sort of at your whim. If someone's late for practice, you know, you have to clearly articulate the expectations to everyone. First of all, what constitutes late? And then if you are late by 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, what happens? If you don't show up, then you have this type of sanction. All right? And so because there was no consistency and there was no formality, that it makes it very, very difficult. You're sending those mixed messages to those athletes. Also, here's the thing, is that sometimes coaches, you know, they, they tend to benefit from athletes that maybe are cheating or are doing things that they're not supposed to. It helps them win games. You know, um, rarely do you hear coaches come out against um, players that, you know, get involved with PED use or anything like that. And it, there's this thing in sports, it's called bracketed morality. And this comes from kind of social psychology, um, ethics, that kind of stuff, kind of in the sports studies realm. And bracketed morality is the idea that you do something wrong in the game, and it's okay. It's okay to break the rules or do something wrong within the game because it's part of gamesmanship. It's just what you do, and it doesn't mean that you're a bad person off the field. If you get caught cheating in the game, it doesn't mean you're a bad person outside of it. But when you have bracketed morality like that, you start to really walk that fine line between those carryover behaviors. Um, the Seattle Seahawks in the NFL uh, recently had 
uh, four or five players that tested positive for PEDs use. Um, and it was, it was Adderall, the ADHD drug, and, or from, for a, a decent number of them. And what it does is it helps supposedly you focus more and block out distractions and things like that. Well, it, first of all, it's illegal to have if you don't have a prescription. Secondly, finally, at the time, you know, Pete Carroll, the coach, has to say something. So during their organized team activities, um, he comes out and he says, hey, we, you know, we, we have to do a better job of ed educating our players. That was it. Now, I don't know what the head coach is supposed to do because these are grown men, these are adults, all right? But oftentimes when you hear of, you know, players getting in trouble with PEDs or PESs, oftentimes the coach doesn't speak on it. Now think about it. If you have an athlete who's taking something that is maybe illegal and against the bylaws of the organization, um, that's going to enhance their performance on some level, well that's going to benefit the coach because what, let's say, and this rarely ever happens, but someone who's taken a banned substance does something because of that substance that's remarkable and allows them to win a game. Okay? Well, let's say that game then is what propelled that team into the playoffs. When the year before they didn't make the playoffs and the coach was on the, the chopping block, so to speak, or on the hot seat and ready to be fired. All right, perhaps then that athlete who then cheated, okay, that cheated, that coach benefits from that. Or in the world of, of college sports, oftentimes it's a, rarely are coaches really getting in trouble for, um, at, you know, additional benefits or things like that. It's usually a booster. Um, the question becomes, does the coach know? Some people say, you know, it's hard that the coach, it's, it's hard to believe that the coach wouldn't know what's going on. And then some say, well, if you're talking about FBS football in the college ranks and, and you've got, or NCAA ranks, and you've got 85 guys on scholarship, so maybe 100 on the team, um, the chances of you knowing every single person and what they're doing and all that is slim, slim and none. But when it comes to coaches, they're the ones that have to answer for this stuff. Now, the players do too as well. But when it comes to you need a figurehead, maybe we talked about with authority. These are not the only leaders in the organization, but they are the figureheads. They, they tend to embody a lot of the power. Oftentimes you don't see the team owner or the athletic director or something like that standing out in front of the reporters and answering questions. So how do we do this? One, usually the idea is through education. Um, is trying to, again, educate coaches to let them know that, you know, it's always that whole thing of, well, I didn't, I didn't lie, I just didn't say anything. Well, there's really no such thing as a white lie. <laughs> um, acquiescence or admit, you know, lying by omission is still lying. And that's what kind of some of the current education is on, is, is trying to say that, look, you know, if, if you're dealing with um, youth sports or scholastic sports, you still need to be focused on the whole idea of social development. When you get to the notion, or, or excuse me, when you get to the level of intercollegiate athletics, there's a, there is more of an emphasis on winning, but according to the NAIA Champions for Character, the NCAA and their mission statement, the idea of intercollegiate athletics is still to be um, a source of social development and a place for these individuals to learn how to be productive members of society. Okay, so education, ed educating coaches on how to kind of navigate some of these waters is primarily where we are now. Does that mean it's working? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I mean, you have millions. That's that's maybe a little much, but hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of coaches. And we hear, you know, let's say you have 200 that are doing really, really bad things. Well, that's still a very, very small minority of the population. But because sport is so high profile and coaches are so high profile and they deal with young, impressionable kids or um, student athletes, um, it becomes something that, that sort of penetrates national and international consciousness. We want to know what's going on. 
here I, I just this is one of those things that um, yeah, if you can just kind of think about these you know look at these questions you don't necessarily need to answer them or anything um, it's just if we're trying to educate coaches on how to do the proper things with regards to discipline and teaching people right and wrong then judging coaches primarily on or exclusively on wins and losses doesn't do any good except when push comes to shove on a Saturday afternoon people are watching college football and you have hundreds of thousands of people that gather into you know stadiums all across the United States are they thinking about graduation rates are they thinking about underneath that helmet and those shoulder pads is a really high quality character young man it, it's hard to say we know the the winning culture sort of the win at all costs the over the over emphasis on winning and comp competitiveness that's very difficult to change but if you don't try and you don't try with coaches you don't try to sort of nip this thing in the bud then it's never going to change whatsoever